Hi, this is Intertextuality number eight. Um, so uh, let's get into it. The first thing I want to mention from the last video, a couple things. If you remember the last section we looked at, he was mentioning how the Quran uses this phrase Turi Sinin. So I wanted to mention where that is. That's here. Waturi Sinin. And by Mount Sinai, Turi Sinin. Okay. Uh, okay, whatever, who cares? Uh, and here he mentioned that it, it's the same thing in uh, the Targum and the Peshitta, which mentions Tura de Sinai. Okay, that's a linguistic connection. And of course, if you want to see the details of that, go back to the last video. Other thing I want to mention is I was mentioning uh, the uh, Jesus connection here in this story, how um, uh, in the psalm, uh, it's the Israelites who are like, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? And God is angry at them for saying that because God uh, knew they were like challenging God and not believing in him. And I was like, so in the Quran, we have the story where the disciples say to Jesus, Oh, Jesus, son of Mary, can your Lord send to us a table sp spread with food from the heaven? And Jesus said, fear a lot, you should be believers. And I was explaining how perhaps Jesus had this in mind. And then uh, I was like, okay, so... Uh, uh, you know, uh, then I was like, uh, I hadn't found at that point uh, uh, an explanation of the verse, of the verses in that way. So even though that came to my mind, at the end I was sort of like retracting it. Well, I did find that explanation, so it's valid. My interpretation, which I was first explaining, was valid. Okay, so as as Sayyuti or not Sayyuti, Saadi mentions, uh, and remember when the disciples said, "Oh, Isa son of Maryam, can your Lord send down to us a table?" Was spread with tooth from heaven, that is a table on which there was food. This did not stem from any doubt on their part in the power of Allah or his ability to do that, rather it was by way of polite request. Because asking for signs and miracles by way of challenge is contrary to true faith, these words of the disciples may give the impression that it was a challenge. And Isa alayhi salam rebuked them and said, Fear Allah if you are true believers. For the faith of the believers makes him constantly fear Allah and comply with Allah's command, so he does not demand, demand signs of which he does not know what the consequences will be. But the disciples stated that their intention intention was not like that. Rather, their intention was good because there was a need for that, etc., etc., etc. So exactly what I was explaining, I found it in Asadi. So when so why is Jesus saying fear Allah should be believers? Perhaps uh, he has this in mind that God criticized the Israelites when they said a similar things. But so then the uh, disciples have to clarify, no, actually we're not like that. Okay. So um, with that in mind, let's uh, do the opening statements that we do and then go into uh, the uh, examples for today. Number one, I mentioned Prophet Muhammad, please, <laughs> not please be upon him, peace be upon him, could not read or write, nor could the Arabs as a whole. Many of the texts being, uh, where we're finding these intertextual connections are untranslated or lost, uh, lost texts, many of these in different areas. Prophet was sincere, I gave many examples of that. I mentioned the fact that even the most ba basic biblical stories were not known in Arabia. I'm waking up in seven hours, apparently, so I guess I'm asleep. Uh, people, again, if someone was teaching him, people would have, wouldn't notice, and there weren't any Jews or priests to teach him around in Mecca anyway. And I mentioned how everything biblical and extra biblical is just a tradition. Okay. With that in mind, let's go to our first example of the day. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to close this. I'm going to close. Why do I want to close that? Okay. So it's, it's using the same document, so uh, it's going to be down. Okay, so here are the connections in Surah Ali Imran. Recall, uh, okay, so Surah Ali Imran has a lot of connections. Recall in episode 5 and also episode 7, I mentioned some of the interactions with Jesus. Uh, so in episode 5, the final example I mentioned, interactions with the nativity story from with the with Surah Maryam and Surah Ali Imran, with the uh, Christian and Syriac and biblical uh, traditions, and also the episode one in that I mentioned the example of the Messiah not dying and being raised up. Uh, and so there is intertextual connection between that and Surah Ali Imran too because it mentions the Messiah being raised up. Also recall the interactions with Abraham from episode four, example five. That's also in Surah Al Imran, the idea that the Jews and Christians were saying Abraham is a Jew and Christians. I mentioned the intertextual connection there. Understand there are also so many historical interactions here. You can check these out in the ancient monotheism videos, part two, second half. Uh, also in future videos. 
check out Blogging Theology's channel. I don't agree with everything, but generally, his content is good stuff. Uh, also, uh, so the Quran is uh, correcting Jew Christian tradition when it uh, mentions all the stuff, which ends up being in line with the historical Jesus. Things like Jesus not thinking he's divine, just the Messiah, just being the Messiah, and a man sent by God, and a prophet and a messenger. The early church being Muslims, uh, Jesus being sent just to the Jews, Jews confirming the Torah, but changing some of it. Okay. With that in mind, let's get to the connections today. There's going to be a long section, actually, because there are many connections in just this uh, one passage we're going to look at, right? So, uh, example one is going to be long. Okay. First thing, actually, from Surah Ali Imran, Allah mentions, After telling the story of Maryam and Jesus, Allah mentions, That is Isa, son of Maryam. Word of truth about which they are in dispute. It is not for Allah to take a son. Glory be to him. When he decrees a matter, he simply tells it be and it is. Okay. Why is this relevant? Remember, that, that is Jesus, son of Maryam. Word of truth about which they dispute. So who is disputing about Jesus, son of Mary? Before the Quran, everyone. Jews, Christians, so many. And even in the early church. So here's from the book, um, James, the brother of Jesus, and the... Uh, early or the lost teachings of Christianity uh, yeah and the lost teachings of Christianity by Jeffrey L. Butts he's a Christian scholar he mentioned scholars today realized that early Christianity was by no means uh, homogenous there were uh, many competing factions within the early church each holding different interpretations of Jesus tensions and disagreements especially over the nature of Jesus whether he was human or divine built up over the years and were eventually resolved, certainly not to everyone's satisfaction at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Ooh, okay. Those who disagreed with the majority vote at Nicaea were forever after de declared to be heretics. These disagreements between the various Christian communities in the 4th fourth, fourth century had their roots already among the earliest Christian communities of the 1st century, especially in the rival interpretations of Jesus held by the earliest Jewish, Christian, and Gentile communities. As noted earlier, the German, German scholar okay, blah, 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 blah. Point is, oof, so much uh, tension between them, right? There was uh, friction between the Jewish Christian community centered in Jerusalem and the Gentile Christian communities centered on Paul's teachings. And the Quran mentions this, that uh, uh, word of truth after uh, about which they are uh, differing about. And in fact, I should have a Quran tab open every time I mention. Uh, the Quran also says, uh, again, after relaying the story of Jesus. Oh God, jeez. Showing five translations. Why? Show me. Okay. That Jesus says, and indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship Him. That is, or this is the straight path. Then the factions differed from among them, right? And concerning Jesus' meaning. So woe to those who disbelieved from the scene of a tremendous day. So the factions, uh, here, yet their various groups have differed among themselves, meaning about Him. So woe to the disbelievers when they face a tremendous state. They were all differing about the, about Jesus, and the Quran mentions this as well. And this book mentions it. Okay, okay. The next one here I have. This again in Surah Al Imran, so Surah 3. And when the angel said, O Maryam, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the world. Of course, I, I talked before about how Mark has this agenda against Maryam and the family of Jesus. Same book. Uh, when scholars have, ref uh, have uh, refused to consider uh, its possibility that these Markan episodes in which the disciples are placed in such an unfavorable light may be more than just the result of the passing of, of tradition or the consequence of the development of theological motif, they fail to consider serious, seriously the possibility that the evangelists might be attacking the disciples intentionally for whatever reason. So, 
he attacks uh, the family of Jesus and uh, Mariam, and I've discussed this a lot before, so I'm not going to get into it now. But I just wanted to show you that that, that is in Surah Ali Imran too. I'm pointing this out because I want to show that there's so much, so much stuff in Surah Ali Imran. Okay. Again, I pointed this one out before. One, so here's an example that I found now uh, about the, uh, the New Testament writers comparing Jesus to, to Adam. I, I'm not sure if this is the example I used before, but basically 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a living, a life-giving spirit. So the last Adam here is a reference to Jesus as this commentary confirms the second Adam or the second Christ. That Christ is here intended is apparent and has been usually admitted by commentators. Indeed, the example of Jesus shall lie is like that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, be, and he was. Okay. And remember, even this one, where I mentioned that Maryam was chosen above all the worlds, you have to take this, remember that Surah Maryam references the fact that Jesus is good to his mother, right? And then I talk a lot about how the Gospels and this and that uh, try and show that Jesus was not good to Maryam and how they, how Mark has an agenda against Maryam. And uh, so that's that's how this becomes relevant, right? So we know this from other evidence in the Quran, and of course we generally know this as well. Right? This has other connections with just the beliefs of Christians and the truth as well, right? It's meaning that Miriam was a great woman, and that's why Allah is mentioning it. Then, of course, I discussed this one as well before. I, I, again, I'm repeating these to show you Surah Three has so many of these connections. This uh, discussion begins a few verses before where Allah is speaking to the Jews and Christians. Why are you arguing about Abraham? Basically saying Abraham is a Jew or a Christian. And it concludes uh, with this and then I think a verse after that or something. And of course this reference before in uh, chapter 2 as well. Or do you say that Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the descendants were Jews or Christians? Say, so, are you more knowing or is Allah? And who is more unjust than one who conceals a testimony as from Allah? And Allah is not unaware of what you do. Remember, I showed you uh, that the texts have these claims to Abraham as well before. But I'll show you a couple different texts now. So, Legend of the Jews, Volume 1, Louis uh, Ginsburg mentions this. But all these divine blessings showered upon Abraham were not undeserved. He was clean of hand and pure of heart, one that did not lift up his soul unto vanity. Oof. He fulfilled all the commands that were revealed later, even the rabbinical injunctions, as for instance, the one related to the limits of a Sabbath day's journey, whereof his reward was that God disclosed to him the new teachings which he expounded daily into the heavenly academy. Weird. Right? <laughs> uh, like some really weird claims about uh, Abraham. Uh, Allah just responds to this like, what? Whoa. <laughs> just check out Allah's response. Ya ahl al-kitabi lima tuhajjuna fi Ibrahima wa ma unzilat al-tawrat wa al-injilu illa min ba'tihi afala ta'qidun O people of the book, why do you argue about Abraham while the Torah and the Injil were not revealed until long after him? Do you not understand? <laughs> He, he uh, no, but here, he, okay, he did the rabbinical injunctions too, okay, the weird, long details, volumes of stuff they write about what you're allowed to do on the Sabbath and not, uh, volumes and volumes and volumes on just the topic of what you can do on the Sabbath, and apparently Abraham did all that, okay, I, I showed you this one before too, how the Bible and uh, their literature shows actually they broke the law, for example, Jacob married two sisters, which is against the law. So, uh, the Quran is correct when it says he was a Muslim, not a Jew or a Christian. Mm. Just, the, just in the philosopher discussed God's heritage to Moses and to Abraham and the other Old Testament prophets, but, but but did not perceive those visions as revelations. But the Godhead, who cannot be who cannot be a subject of vision, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not see the Father and the ineffable Lord of all. Rather, they saw the invisible God being flesh. The Logos conducted the proof. God did not reveal himself in the forms. Okay, I don't know why I included this. Okay, so, oh, Tertullian also claimed that Abraham received a vision of the sun. I think Abraham knew who Jesus was. And remember here, it was Makana Ibrahimu Yahudiyan Wala Nisraniya. He was not a Jew nor a Christian. Do you say they were Jews or Christians? Okay, so here I'm showing you the Christian connections. Many early church fathers were trying to say Abraham was like a secret Trinitarian and stuff like that. Okay. Like it when I make that sound. 
Eusebius of Caesarea argued the hospitable. La la la. Abraham saw one man who he worshipped as a deity. So this is according to Eusebius. He fell down immediately and addressed one of them as Godhead. <laughs> so Abraham knew the Trinity, apparently. John uh, Chrysostom upheld that the righteous Abraham referred to the three strangers as my lord, but he gave precedence to one of them. Chrysostom elaborated further by stating that the two angels went down, went to destroy the town while the Lord continued to con uh, the conversation with the righteous. He further read the story as a revelation of Christ to Abraham. The two angels shared in his redemptive work and blah blah blah. Okay, Cyril of Alexandria exp uh, established the episode at Mamre was a revelation of the Holy Trinity because although Abraham saw three people, he addressed them as one. Tradition that affirmed this episodic episode as revelation of the Holy Trinity continued in the later Eastern ex uh, exegetic tradition. The author of the anonymous dialogue with the Jews, as well as Maximus, the uh, confessor, wrote extensively about this aspect. Maximus perceived the spiritual world as mystically imprinted on the sensible world in symbolic forms. Uh, la, 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 la. This re reciprocity allowed any material image like Abraham's three angelic forms to serve as signs manifesting the invisible and unknowable trinity to those prepared to see it properly with their spiritual sight. For Abraham, it was a true co contemplative transcending matter through the recognition of the Imago Trinity's image of the Trinity in his soul. Hospi hospi hospitality of Abraham affirms the fusion of antinomical nature of God, both the monad, unity of the Trinity, and the triad, the three hypostases of God. Gregory the Theologian claimed that Abraham received a vision of God not in his role as a deity, but as a man. Austin of Hippo affirmed Abraham's understanding of the unity of the Trinity while greeting the three strangers. Abraham confessed to one God in three hypostases. This event was thereafter a symbolic prefiguration of the of the tri Trinitarian nature of God. In his later writings, Augustine of Hippo refrained from any visual representation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Ath uh, Athanasius of Sinai and Ambrose Midian noted the event to be a Trinitarian revelation. Procopius of Gaza summarized the Christian... Oh my god, how much stuff? Procopius of Gaza summarized the Christian view about the identity of Abraham's three guests as follows. The three men were either three angels or most, or possibly one of them was God while the other two were angels. Most probably the three men addressed the, by Abraham the single served as a type for the holy uh, and consubstantial trinity. Finally, the greater... Uh, <laughs> finally, the... Finally, the great defender of icons, John of Damascus, knows that Abraham did not see the divine nature, for no one has ever seen God, but he saw an image of God <laughs> to whom he made a sign of supplication. <laughs> the general legal service of the Holy <laughs> Fathers uh, describes the events as revela <laughs> revelation of the trying hypostatic God to Abraham. <laughs> Uh, got to Abraham. In addition, the canon of Joseph the Salt read, You saw the Trinity as responsible for humans and provided them, <laughs> provided them with hospitality. The righteous Abraham. <laughs> Similar statements are found in the canon of the metro uh, Metropolitan of uh, Smyrna from the middle of the 9th century. <laughs> oh my god, this is so weird. Okay, anyway, I mean, the easy reputation of the fact is an angel is called. With that uh, four-letter name, uh, he's the one who wrestles with uh, Jacob in the Bible, and Jacob defeats him. <laughs> so that's God. I mean, angel God defeated, right? Um, and so, I mean, I don't think it's appropriate to call an angel with the names of God and this and that, but, uh, I mean, the, the, the names that should be exclusively God's, and I don't know if the four-letter name letter name is a name of God or not, but uh, certainly wouldn't call an angel that. Seems inappropriate to me, but... Uh, that's how the Bible uses it, because it's made clear in Hosea that it was an angel, even though so the text says the four-letter name. Okay, Okay. now let's move on. <sighs> so funny. Let's move on to the next part, uh, next uh, verses that we want to look at in uh, Surah Al-Imran. So this is right after the Abraham uh, discussion. Ya ahl al-kitab lima takfuruna bi ayatillahi wa antum tashhadun. O people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the verses, in the signs of Allah? While you witness. So, ayat actually means signs. Okay. Why do you disbelieve in the signs of Allah while you witness? And that includes the, the book. Like the verses of the book. Like the quote unquote verses of the book. Which are also called ayat. The signs. And also other signs of God. Okay. 
يا أهل الكتاب لم تلبسون الحق بالباطل وتكتمون الحق وأنتم تعلمون Oh people of the book, why do you mix the truth with falsehood and hide the truth knowingly? New, New Jerome Biblical Commentary mentions uh, the outlook of Jewish Christianity, which as a separate movement was eventually defeated by Pauline and died out. Perhaps we were born in a different form as Islam. Pretty much uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, biblical scholars mentioned the first faith of the Christians was Jewish Christianity. And here you can see so many of them comparing that to Islam. So they know very well that the first Christians were Muslims. But yet they won't believe. Look at them. The New Jerome biblical comment. Is this guy a Christian? Oh, or sorry, is this guy a Muslim? Is Raymond Brown, did Raymond Brown become a Muslim? Raymond Brown? No. Oh, I'm saying this. You witness. <laughs> you know it's true. But no, but many of these guys actually, uh, when they're doing their historical, historical work and writing their scholarship and everything, uh, they, uh, they, they mention all this though. Jesus, Jesus never claimed to be God and all these things. But yet they end up privately believing in Trinity and all that stuff. And I'll show you that in a minute. Here is a, a book, The Missing Link, Chapter 4. Here is a paradox of world historical proportions. Jewish Christianity indeed disappeared with the Christian church, but was preserved in Islam. Ooh, The Hidden History of Jesus' Royal Family and the Birth of Christianity, the Gen Jesus Dynasty by James D. Tabor. One of the most fascinating turns of history would be that the view of Jesus represented by the Jesus dynasty has survived ironically in aspects of Islamic tradition as well. Brother of Jesus, this guy, Jeffrey G. Putz, who's Christian. This is a Lutheran. You know, I, think I have the book right next to me. Let me check uh, what he is. He's a ordained Lutheran minister and an adjunct professor. Okay, so he's an ordained Lutheran minister. Christian. It is more than intriguing that the Muslim understanding of Jesus is very much in conformity with the first Christian orthodoxy, the original Jewish Christian understanding of Jesus. Is he, uh, he knows, he knows there were Muslims. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so when Allah says this in the Quran, this is actually very relevant to our days. O people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the signs of Allah while you witness? This is a sign of God that the Jesus in the Quran is perfect. Perfect with the historical Jesus. Perfectly in line with the historical Jesus. This is a sign. Oh, people of the book, why do you mix the truth with falsehood and hide the truth knowingly? You know this, but uh, rather he's going to preach in his church. Remember, he's a minister. He's going to preach Trinity and all that in his church. Even though in a scholarship, he knows. There's actually a book on this. Uh, okay, okay. Ah. Damn, what is this? What have I done? What have I done? Okay, so um, is this from a book. Uh, I forgot to put the title of the book. So uh, I'll see if I'll put that in the document um, in the description when I post it. But let's just read uh, what the, what he says, okay? It's another book. And this guy is a Trinitarian. It's not just that the Trinity is nowhere explicitly affirmed in the New Testament, there are texts that seem to contradict the doctrine again, read through the lens of historical criticism. This guy's a Chris, Christian, Trinitarian, I've heard. I, I mean, it's mentioned, someone in Speaker's Corner mentioned he's a Trinitarian, but point is, he's a Christian, believes in the Trinity. Gospel of Mark, for example, now I'm reading the text that contradict the doctrine. He says the Gospel of Mark, for example, certainly thinks of Jesus the Messiah and the Son of Man. But it's unclear whether the author of the second gospel considered Jesus to be God. Uh, and that's even with the lower case G, which means not even the God, just a God. The gospel does use the term Son of God for Jesus. The centurion at Jesus' crucifixion, nothing how Jesus died, speaks of him as God's son. But it is unclear what that would mean, that would have meant to an ancient audience. The translation could be, surely this was a son of God. But in the ancient world, even that does not necessarily mean the son was also God himself. Think about the Old Testament over and over. Uh, people are called the sons of God. Okay, The son of God, the son of God. David is called the son of God, for example. And it just means righteous person. This is uh, an idiom in Arabic, or in uh, Aramaic and Hebrew. E even the term father is uh, an idiom. It means Lord. Okay, But in the ancient world, even that... Uh, okay, so it certainly would not necessarily mean that the son was divine being in the full, sen full sense the highest God was. In spite of modern apolog 
apologist who makes arguments such as Jesus as the son of an elephant is an elephant, so the son of God must also be God, or just as the son of an elephant is an elephant, so the son of God must also be God. The ancient persons would not have seen things that way. That is made clearer even within the Bible. Several texts speak of uh, human beings as sons of God without ascribing true divine status to them, or at, or at least without ascribing the kind of divine status uh, Christians later attribute to Jesus Christ. Moreover, in Mark 10:18, as we saw in the previous chapter, Jesus seems to be denying divine status for himself. It is quite possible to read the Gospel of Mark if done without later Christian assumptions and take Jesus and Mark to be human but not a divine figure. Remember, Allah, when he says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the scripture, he's talking to Jews and Christians. Look at, look at, look at the Christians. Although Paul certainly believes Jesus is divine in some sense, he seems not to accord to Jesus' complete divinity, divine equality with the Father. He can speak of Christ and God as two different persons in a hierarchical relationship. When Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.3 offer, uh, offers something of an equation, Christ is the head of man, man is the head of woman, God is the head of Christ. We must assume subordinate relations in each case. The parallelism doesn't work otherwise. Christ is no more equal to God than man is to Christ. The same seems to be assumed later in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. God temporarily, temporarily puts all things under subjection to Christ, who after subject, subjecting all things to himself, then puts everything again under subjection to God, including himself. So Christ is subjected to God. Some texts of the New Testament do accept the divinity of Jesus, but they seem not at all to agree about when Jesus became divine. Some early Christians believed that Jesus was a mere human at his birth, but then he was later adopted as God's son, God's son sometime later. According to what may be the original reading of Luke 3.22, You are my son, the beloved, today I have begotten you. Jesus is for, begotten by God at his baptism. According to some other early Christians, apparently... Okay. Apparently, Jesus uh, became God's son only at his resurrection, as reflected in passages in Acts. In one sermon delivered by Peter in Acts, God made Jesus Lord and Messiah at some point, Acts 2.36. In a later sermon of Paul in Acts, one statement suggests that God adopted Jesus as a son at the resurrection. Paul himself seems to betray knowledge of such a Christology in one of his letters. In Romans 1.4, Paul says that God designated Jesus a son of God by resurrection from the dead. The most normal meaning of the Greek would be that God made Jesus a son by means of the resurrection in the way a priest or pope or other authority made someone a king or queen at the time of the declaration or coronation. That this terminology is recited by Paul is significant, since Paul himself seems to believe that Jesus was God's son already in some pre-existing state. I don't. Uh, I don't believe that because I think uh, Paul uh, um, sees Jesus as an angel. I actually believe that. Uh, uh, that scholars are right when they point that out. And also, uh, G uh, Paul is clear that uh, he sees Jesus as created. So it seems that uh, Paul did thought he was an angel in his pre-existent form, who then later becomes the Son of God at the resurrection. Okay. I take it that Paul is here quoting a formula about Christ he has encountered elsewhere. At any rate, one can cite New Testament texts that on their face do not teach a very orthodox Christology and certainly not Trinitarian. So this whole book is actually about what do we do about the fact that historically we know these things about Jesus and the earliest Christians, yet our, our theology te teaches us Jesus uh, is God and Trinity and all this stuff. How do we reconcile? You know, We all know that Jesus only came for the Jews and all these things. He did not predict his death and blah, blah, blah. Yet, uh, that's what uh, we believe. So how do we reconcile this from a historical standpoint and uh, what uh, the church teaches? This is his conclusion. This is his answer. It will be my contention in this chapter, however, that we need not become bad historians in order to be good theologians. Theologians. Even if the New Testament authors were not familiar with the doctrine of the Trinity as it became defined in the Great Councils and Creed, we may take the liberty of reading the New Testament theologically rather than historically as teaching trin Trinitarian theology. What did Allah say? O oh, people of the scripture, it's referring to Jews and Christians, why do you disbelieve in the signs of Allah while you witness? I showed you, they know that they were Muslims. O oh, people of the book, why do you mix the truth with falsehood and hide the truth knowingly? Uh, they don't tell this to the public. Only 
this is only uh, uh, mentioned in the academic cir circles. In their books, that, that only the academics and the, the, this kind of audience reads. In their church, they're going to teach Trinity. Here, they're saying, oh, um, yeah, we know the truth about Jesus, but let's just read the Trinity into it. Why do you mix the truth with falsehood and hide the truth knowingly? They hide it from the public. They won't tell, they won't tell their church this. And they'll mix the truth with falsehood, as I just showed you. So all this is so relevant. It, it, it uh, interacts with even them today, right? Showing you these attitudes are in Christian and Jewish texts even today within their scholars. Seven Torah passages of non-Mosaic origin according to Ibn Ezra and Rabbi Joseph Bontel. So now I'm going to show you the Jews themselves know what they got. It's not, it's not the Torah of Moses. And uh, you better hide it from the people. So this is what Ibn Ezra says. And uh, he, he says, so as you can see, you will recognize the truth. Basically, this is about how Ibn Ezra, who's one of the, most, one of the foremost Jewish commentators, and then a later explanation of Ibn Ezra from Joseph Bontos, both rabbis know that the Torah they got is not the one from Moses. It has verses. Basically, they say there are so many verses that are not from Moses. Uh, even though they would still uh, uphold mosaic authorship, but you can tell they know they know when you read their writings, they know what's up. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, in some of his comments, Ibn Ezra, meaning Ibn Ezra, references a secret that he wishes to hint at but not disclose. Ibn Ezra has never stated his meaning explicitly, but it's, but it's clear what he means if you read the writings. But his point and his reasoning were later explained clearly by Rabbi Joseph Ben Eliezer Bonfils in his commentary on Ibn Ezra titled "Blah Blah Blah." Okay. In short, Bonfils explained Ibn Ezra believed that certain biblical passage were, passages were not written by Moses. In these uh, terrorist comments, Ibn Ezra refers to six passages of Aristotle. And there are other passages, by the way. You will recognize the truth, meaning if you understand the secret of these verses, verses i.e. Moses didn't write them. Then, at the conclusion, Ibn Ezra says, the wise will be silent. Meaning, don't tell people about this. Joseph Bonfils in his commentary explains what that means. It would not be appropriate to reveal the secret to average people lest they make light of the Torah. For anyone who is not sufficiently wise cannot differentiate between verses that contain commandments and verses that are simply narrative. Additionally, because the nations who tell us your Torah was once the truth but you replaced it and changed it, for these reasons, he says, the wise will be silent. For the wise know that this does no damage. Only the fools would attack him, a.k.a. Ibn Ezra, for this. So they they know what's up. Why Why don't they want average people to know, why don't they want the nation that says your Torah used to be a true, but then you corrupted it, which is Muslims. Why don't they want us to know? Come on. Come on. Everyone knows why. Because obvious Moses didn't write the book. So they're like, shush, don't tell people what all I mention. Oh, people of the scripture, why do you disbelieve in the signs of Allah? While, while, you, wit while you witness. You know, the Jews will... 24-7 argue that uh, the Torah has not been corrupted. Islam is wrong. Islam is wrong. They know very well that uh, that it's been corrupted, as I just showed you. Because it's too obvious. It's too obvious. O people of the book, why do you mix the truth with falsehood and hide the truth knowingly? Don't tell it to the public. They'll make them look fun. Why do you hide the truth? Why do you mix the truth with falsehood? You know these verses aren't from Moses. Why? Hide the truth knowingly. Allah mentioned that, and here I'm showing you that's what they do. So this is their attitude reflected in the Quran. Even today we know this. Then the next verse. I believe it's the next verse. وَقَالَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْ أَحْلِ الْكِتَابِ آمِنُوا بِالَّذِي أُنْسِلَةٌ بِالَّذِي أُنْسِلَةٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَجَهَ النَّهَارِ وَكْفُرُوا آخَرَةٌ a group among the people of the book said, or say, uh, believe in what has been revealed to the believers in the morning and reject it in the evening so that they may abandon their faith. So basically pretend to be Muslim, then apostate. And then be like, oh, we, we left Islam in an attempt to get Muslims to, uh, to leave Islam. This is everywhere. You see this on, on the internet today, everywhere. 
Uh, Daniel Halkir, who just did a podcast with a Catholic who now became Muslim, and he even mentioned this, that, yeah, once he pretended that he became Muslim and made a video like, I left Islam, just to get views. This is everywhere today. Christians do this 24-7. If you've been on the internet, you know there's true people pretending to be ex-Muslims in this and that. Quote, unquote, ex-Muslims. I call them murtad, apostates. That's what they are. They're murtad. Murtadin. Apostates, okay? Pretend to be ex-Muslims. Quote, unquote, that's the term they use. Murtad. We see this even today, and Allah mentioned it in the Quran. Right? So, look, everything is relevant. Right? Next verse. Next uh, ayah, I mean. وَلَا تُؤْمِنُوا إِلَّا لِمَنْ تَبِعَ دِينَكُمْ And uh, only believe those who follow your religion. قُلْ إِنَّ الْهُدَى هُدَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يُؤْتَى أَحَدٌ مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ أَوْ يُهَاجُّوكُمْ إِنْدَ رَبِّكُمْ قُلْ إِنَّ الْفَدْلَ بِيَدِ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ And uh, say surely, basically, and believe only those who follow your religion, that's what they say. Allah commands, say, the only true guidance is Allah's guidance. They also said, meaning do not meaning they also said do not believe that someone will receive uh, receive knowledge similar to yours or argue against you before your lord say indeed all bounty is in the hands of Allah he granted to whoever he wills and Allah is all bountiful all knowing he sh- he chooses uh, whoever he wills to receive his mercy and Allah is the lord of infinite bounty so uh, basically okay, I'll find you a another translation for this then I'll show you another eye uh, about this so basically in another translation Allah uh, so this is interpreted as Allah's words do you fear lest someone be given knowledge like you were given or that they would thereby argue with you before your Lord okay say indeed uh, all um, all bounties in the hand of Allah he granted to whoever he wills and Allah is all-encompassing all-knowing so basically there's a reference to the Jews that, the fact that the Jews did not want to accept the Prophet because uh, he was an Arab. They were like, come on. Why Why did an Arab get revelation? We should have gotten it. We Jews should have gotten it. As Allah mentioned in this verse. Miserable is the price that they have sold their souls for. Or sold themselves. That they would disbelieve in what Allah has revealed through their outrage. That Allah would send down his favor upon whom he willed upon whom he wills from among his slaves. So they returned, having earned wrath upon wrath, and for the disbelievers as a humiliating punishment. So you see, now the Qur'an here is talking about the same thing, like that the Jews, jealous that it came to the Arabs. He chooses whoever he wills to receive his mercy. Allah is the Lord of, of infinite bounty. They don't want an Arab. They don't want a Gentile to get revelation. Guess what? This is reflected in the Jews' uh, uh, books as well. Here's the legends of the Jews. I think I've been told this is actually inauthentic narration but it shows you this attitude it shows you the attitude they had okay. even if you uh, go to the bible just make clear a prophet is going to be coming uh, it's not going to be an israelite uh, uh, yet you find these verses or, or these stories for example legends of the jews mentions after this after balaam who is uh, who is a prophet near the time of moses According to them, this was Balaam's last prophecy. After this, the prophetic spirit left Balaam, and God, in this way, granted Moses' wish to reserve the gift of prophecy as a special distinction to Israel. Balaam was the last prophet of the nations. So they don't want uh, prophecy or prophets in this and that revelation to come to other nations. And this uh, proves this attitude. And Allah referenced this in the Quran and refuted it. Right? I just showed you the verses. I showed you the other verses as well to clarify. Inauthentic. So I've heard it's inauthentic, and the fact also it contradicts. There are more authentic sects. For example, De- Deuteronomy 18 contradicts this in light of Deuteronomy 34, and this will be discussed below. Okay. So uh, the respected Archam Shomash commentary states the following about Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 34. The sages note the Torah statement here that in Israel there will never be a prophet like Moses implies that among the non-Jewish nations there could be such a such a prophet. So there are more authentic texts mentioned this as well. Yet, I showed you clearly that even though they have these clear texts, they still have this attitude that he's not supposed to be, that uh, we won't accept uh, a, a, a Gentile prophet and revelation to Gentiles. Only us Israelites should, should get it. And the narration I showed you uh, proves this sort of attitude that they have. Right? Uh, even here, Allah mentioned, 
أم يحسدون الناس على ما آتاهم الله من فضله فقد آتينا على إبراهيم الكتاب وآتيناهم والحكمة وآتيناهم ملك نازيمة This is about the Jews. Or do they envy the people for Allah's bounties? Or do they envy people for Allah has given them of his bounty? But we had surely given the family of Abraham the scripture and wisdom and conferred upon them a great kingdom. And some among them believed in it, and some among them were averse to it, and sufficient is hell as a blaze. Okay. Here is another uh, prophet that they have, Abadiah who was a prophet later on in the time of one kings and he was from uh, he was from he was an Edomite he himself was an Edomite Obadiah was an Edomite that means a non-Jew they said there's no prophecy after Balaam no prophecy to the nations after Balaam Obadiah is a lot after Balaam Balaam is near the time of Moses this guy is centuries later so Whatever narration they had in the legends of the Jews, inauthentic, contradicted, but it shows you the attitude they have, even though their own books clearly mention, nah, now there can be uh, Gentile prophets, yet, yet they have that attitude. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's supposed to have him from, from the persecution of Jezebel. The prophets in the cave. Uh, finally, he had borrowed. Okay, whatever. And uh, so uh, he's a prophet, as you can see here. Ooh, okay. Now let's go on to another one. The next connection. I'll show you. Bava Kama, one thirteen B. It is permitted to retain. His lost item, meaning a Gentile's lost item, as Rav Hamaber Gurya says, okay, from where is it derived that it is permitted to retain the lost item of a Gentile? It is derived from a verse as it is stated with regard to mitzvah of returning a lost item with every lost thing of your brothers, Deuteronomy 22 3, indicating that it is only to your brother that you return a lost item, but you do not return a lost item to a Gentile. Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنُهُ بِقِنْتَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنُهُ بِدِينَارٍ لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ إِلَّا مَا دُمْتَ عَلَيْهِ قَائِمًا ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَا فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ سَبِيلٌ وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ فَلَا مَنْ أَوْفَى بِأَحْدِهِ وَاتَّقَى فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ there are some among the people of the book who, if entrusted with a stack of gold, will readily return it. Yet there are others who, if entrusted with a single coin, will not repay it unless you constantly demand it. This is because they say we are not accountable for explaining the unlettered. And so they attribute lies to Allah knowingly. Here he's translated it as Gentiles. Uh, so basically they're referring to the pagan Arabs. So they're like, uh, oh, they're Arabs, so uh, there's no blame in us. So financially taking advantage of Gentiles is mentioned in the Quran as well. Absolutely, those who honor their trust and shun evil, surely Allah loves those who are mindful. Look, all this, this is just verse 76. So this is all in the same passage, uh, near verses. Almost every other verse, or every verse, we're finding these intertextual connections. And uh, connections with just generally their attitudes and whatnot. Even Deuteronomy 23.9, do not charge your brother interest, but you may charge a foreigner interest, but not your brother. This is chapter 4. For wrongdoing on the part of the Jews, we made unlawful for them certain good foods which had been made, which had been lawful to them, and for their averting from the way of Allah many. And for their taking of interest while they had been forbidden from it, and their consuming of the people's wealth unjustly, and we have prepared for the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. Take look, look at this. Uh, you may charge a foreigner interest mm. for their taking of interest while they had been forbidden from it, and their consuming of the people's wealth unjustly. You know they make stuff up in these books. I mentioned this before, the, uh, I'm mentioning it again because, again, it's in the same passage, so I'm just trying to show you this one passage has so much intertextuality. Indeed, those who trade Allah's covenant and their oaths for a fleeting gain, 
they will have no share in the hereafter. Okay, and if we go to the Talmud, we find it mentions Kul Israel Yashlehem Halek. Though, so further uh, opposition to the above mentioned Talmudic belief appears in another Quranic verse. Q 377. Those who take a small price for the covenant of Allah and their own oaths, they have no portion in the hereafter. The uh, Arabic is La Khalaq Lahum. Okay, now in the Talmud, we have this statement here uh, in Sanhedrin All Israel has a portion in the hereafter. Kul Israel, yes, Lahem Halak. Lahem Halak. La khalaq lahum. La means no, like they will not be having. So really a re relevant portion is this khalaq lahum, laham halaq. So this is reverse actually. So laham is first, in the Quran it's second. Halaq is second, in the Quran it's first. Because that makes sense with the grammar. So laham halaq, laham connected here, lahum halaq connected here, khalaq. Laham halaq. So it's a bilingual pun. Okay. So there's connection in this ayah as well. As they mentioned, this is a uh, bilingual pun. The Arabic words are reminiscent of the Hebrew words in the Talmud. Okay. The next verse. There you go. Next ayah. Another connection. Uh, everywhere there's connection. That's what I. It's crazy. Okay. وَإِنَّ مِنْهُمْ لَفَرِيقًا يَلْؤُونَ أَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ لِتَحْسَبُوهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَيَقُولُونَ أَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ There are some among them who distort the book with their tongues to make you think that it is from the book, but it is not from the book. They say it is from Allah, but it is not from Allah, and so they attribute lies to Allah knowingly. Here in the Talmud, Megillah 25b, so Megillah 25b, however, okay, which is sages taught in uh, Beretta, all of the verses that are written in the Torah in a coarse manner are read in a refined manner. For example, the term Yishgalina shall lie with her is read as though it is. it said Yishkavena, which is a more refined term, so changing what they believe is the words of God. Now, of course, I... Uh, the Quran is probably not referring to this specifically, right? Perhaps it is because it's general, uh, but uh, you know it's referring to just the general trend of the Jews doing this. But I'm citing this passage to you to show you that yes, they do have this trend in their own books. It's preserved as well in whatever form of books they have. The term with hemorrhoids, bafolim, is read bata horim. The term doves dung. <laughs> What is up with the Bible? Okay. Her yonim is read div yonim. The phrase to eat their own ex excrement, heroi bhem, and drink their own urine, my me shi What is the stuff in the Bible? Okay. Is read with more delicate terms to eat their own excrement, <laughs> tazao atam, and drink their own urine, urine. my my regularly hem. <laughs> oh, oh my. Oh my. Well, <laughs> That is strange, but um, anyway, if they believe this is the word of God, and that, and yet they're changing it right now, I don't, I don't believe this. This is the Torah of Moses and whatnot. It is obviously written after Moses, but you can see that they still do certainly have this attitude when they don't like something, change how it's said. Allah mentioning mentioning this as well, right? There are some among those who distort the book with their tongues. They think make you think it is from the book, but it's not what the book says. They say it is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And so they attribute lies to Allah knowingly. They say this from God, but it, they, everyone knows Allah isn't from God. Come on. Okay. Next. Oh, okay. So I'll mention this too. So uh, with regards to distorting the words in chapter 2, it's also mentioned they do this with the hands. So woe to those who distort the scripture with their own hands, then say this from Allah, seeking a fleeting gain. So woe to them for uh, for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what they have earned. Again, we find this reflected in the Talmud. Not necessarily what the Quran is referring to, perhaps it is, because it's general, uh, as one of the things that's being referred to, but definitely 
I'll show, this attitude is in Jewish tradition. As this is evidence of Midrash Den Chuma Bishalach 60. I know I screwed up the Hebrew, but whatever. The verse is my soul hath. Uh, okay, so basically. Okay, so the verse of my soul hath them still in remembrance and is bowed down within me, and it may be that the Lord will look on mine eyes, were amended by the men of the great synagogue. Who were they? They're called scribes because they counted every letter in the Torah and interpreted it. So they say the great synagogue had prophets and scribes in it. Thus they amended, and lo, they put the branch unto my nose to read their nose. Likewise, they altered the verse we are discussing. Surely he that touched you touched the apple of my eye to read his eye. This was to teach us that everyone who rises up against Israel is considered blah, blah, blah. However, the text was modified by the scribes of the great synagogue, Zechariah 2.12 as well. And here they say they, these were scribes, prophets, etc. This verse was also modified. Here you can see so many verses modified. Okay, Job 7.20 was changed. The... the Hab one twelve was modified also. Was altered, blah blah blah. So they're changing it with their hands. Then they say it's from the prophets. Why? Because they don't want people to think there's uh, that uh, God has an eye in this and that. And so uh, when it says my eye, for example, they're like, oh, people will think God has an eye because I guess they don't they don't believe God has an eye. His Jews don't believe that. So uh, quote unquote, they say they want to get rid of anthropomorphism of God because Judaism really got influenced by Greek and Roman. Uh, philosophy which was all like God is so abstract and this and that so now the rabbis want want to turn the God of the Bible to be more abstract like that so they take out all these uh, verses and some for sure are probably metaphorical and others not but you know they got to change the text to reflect their uh, Greek views and uh, I'll mention this so woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands then say this from law in order to exchange it for a small price the price in this case their own new roman greek theological views woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they earn so again i'm showing you these things are in jewish tradition next up we go back to jesus in the next verse the next verse actually brings us back to jesus it is not appropriate for someone who Allah has blessed with the scripture, wisdom, and prophethood to say to people, worship me instead of Allah. Rather, he would say, uh, be devoted to the worship of your Lord alone in accordance with what these prophets read in the scripture and what they taught. Okay, I think that's a bad translation. I will show you the correct translation right now. I'll show you the next verse's correct translation as well. Maybe that is one valid interpretation, but I, I see I'm referring to the this translation. Okay. It is not for a human that Allah should give him the scripture and authority and prophethood, and then he would say to the people, be be servants to me rather than Allah. Uh, rather, be pious scholars of the Lord because of what you have studied of the Scripture, and because of what, and because of what you have studied, uh, or because of what you have taught of the Scriptures, and because of what you have studied. Nor could He order you to take the angels and prophets as lords. Would He order you to disbelieve after you had been Muslims? Right, so uh, if the children of Israel used to be Muslims before, why would Jesus come and start uh, ordering them to uh, worship prophets and lords and angels and whatnot? Right? The angels, of course, th this is general. So, uh, of course, the primary allusion is to Jesus, but, you know, it's general. So it's just general, generally mentioning prophets as a whole as well. But, of course, <laughs> when you know this whole chapter, uh, at least this section of the whole chapter is all about we just came after discussing the story of Jesus and this and that. So the, the primary allusion being made to is Jesus, right? A few interesting things in this. Number one, Jesus never says worship in the Bible, right? So the Quran pointing that out, that Jesus never said this. And the Quran is clear that Jesus never says this, right? Uh, for example... Right, so 
They certainly disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah, son of Maryam. While the Messiah has said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Indeed, he who associates others with the law, Allah has forbidden him paradise, and his refuge is fire, and there are not for the wrongdoers any helpers. So interestingly, just like the, the, the Quran mentions this. And interestingly, Jesus never said, be be worshippers of me, be slaves of me. Be, uh, and this is, Christians have such a hard time uh, 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 to find this in the Bible, because it's not there. There's no statement where Jesus himself says, worship me, or that I am God. I'll point out, the prophets didn't say this. The primary allusion is to Jesus. Of course, Jesus never said this. right? So the Quran is pointing out, it's not for prophets to say this. And the allusion being to Jesus. And of course, Jesus never actually even says it in their own text. Very good. By the Quran mentioned here. Very, very interesting thing mentioned by Allah. right? Very good connection. Okay. Also, the uh, other thing is, uh, uh, of course, this is also directed to the Jews, like uh, the discourses with people of the book in general, so it's with Jews and Christians. Here I mentioned, remember how it says, Wabi ma kuntum tadrusun, uh, and because of what you have been studying, again, I think this is a bad translation. Wabi ma kuntum tadrusun, uh, here I showed it was, and because of what you have been studying, right? Uh, so, and because of what you have studied, so that's interesting because the word tadrusun uh, uh, calls has like a callback as a hint as a connection to the Arabic word midrash midrash tadrusun midrash are connected in Arabic right there's there's a sort of a hint to this Arabic word midrash and of course the uh, Jews use the same word for their explanations like their tafsirs like their um, explanations of uh, Old Testament passages like their commentaries midrash of course, their Jewish sem uh, schools are also called Midrash, Midrasha, Beit Midrash, etc., etc. And so the Quran, when it says Tadrusun, it's a it actually has a connection and a resonance. Re it resonates with the Jewish people who are hearing this. They can connect it to how they use a very similar word as well, right? And that's a linguistic connection. Also, uh, uh, here, G uh, here, Allah mentions again. I don't like this translation. Uh, what did I? Yeah, what, uh, what just happened? This edit was seconds ago. Okay, let's just go back down to um, where we were, I guess. Uh, God, okay. Okay, we were here, okay. So, notice how it says, uh, rather he would say, be, okay, rather he would say, be pious scholars of the Lord. Kunu Rabbaniyin. Rabba, here you can see, Rabbaniyina. Rabbaniyin, okay. So, th the primary reference being made to Jesus, and it's being said that rather a prophet would say, be Rabbaniyin, scholars. Of course, that will hearken you back to Jesus, because in the New Testament, he's called Rabuni. Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Ooh. Become what? Kunu Rabbaniyin. And again, the, the allusion is, this is Jesus, the, the allusion is refuting these claims about Jesus. The idea that uh, he's God and whatnot, that uh, he claimed to be God and whatnot. Of course, because the Christians will say Jesus claimed to be God, even though it's not in the New Testament. Uh, and so uh, here we have uh, Allah mentioning that rather prophets would say become a rabbi, a rabbaniyin. And here the, Jesus has this title. Here's just a wor verse mentioning it. She she calls Jesus rabuni, rabuni, rabuni become rabbaniyin. Okay. Of course, also has a rabbis. Uh, that's what the Jews use, and uh, of course the rabbis. Uh, the, so there's a Jewish connection there too. Okay. Next connection here is uh, the fact that uh, it's mentioned. And he would never ask you to take angels and prophets as lords. The angel thing is int interesting. Of course, there are many reasons for why it's here. For example, uh, you know, some uh, Jews have exalted angels beyond the status historically. Even uh, a Metatron is an angel that's been exalted you know, by certain sects um, of the Jews. 
traditionally, um, even today, they have some sort of this these aspects of the Metatron being exalted beyond where he should be. You know, the Talmud seems to be saying that no, he's not yet. They did it anyway, despite what the Talmud says, despite what the Old Testament says, right, in their Kabbalah and whatnot. Also, uh, he is called little uh, than the four-letter name of God in the, uh, the Talmud. But even though they don't believe he's the second divine figure, they still do shirk with him. Um, you know, using a, a, a uh, calling him a little than a what they believe is the name of God. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, committing, that's uh, associating a part with God and his names and attributes. Okay. But uh, anyway, the other relevant thing of why angels are mentioned here, of course, the Arabs who would be listening to this later on, uh, they used to worship angels. So there's a reason for that to be mentioned. Also because Paul sees Jesus as an angel. And um, many Christian sects have seen Jesus to be actually an angel in his pre-existent form. So he was an angel, then he came down, became a prophet, then he went up and now became an angel again. Yeah. And uh, Paul, Paul, also believes Jesus is an angel. I'm going to read out to you what Bart Ehrman says in his book. Uh, but the clear, uh, so it basically talks about how he's read Galatians hundreds of times in both English and Greek, but the clear import of what he says in Galatians 4.14 simply never registered with me until frankly a few months ago. In this verse, Paul calls Christ an angel. The reason it never registered with me is that the statement is a bit obscure and I had always interpreted it in an alternative way. Thanks to the work of other scholars, I now see the error of my ways. This is Bart Ehrman in How Jesus Became God. Okay, In the context of the verse, Paul is reminding the Galatians of how they first received him when he was ill in their midst and they helped restore him to health. Paul, think, Paul writes, even though my bodily condition was a test for you, you did not mock or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Jesus Christ. I'd always read the verse to say the Galatians had received Paul in his infirm state the way they would have received an angelic visitor or even Christ himself. Or even Christ himself, okay? In fact, however, the grammar of the Greek suggests something quite different. As Charles something... Uh, has argued and has now been affirmed in a book on Christ as an angel by New Testament specialist Susan Garrett. The verse is not saying that the Galatians received Paul as an angel or as Christ. It is saying that they received him as they would an angel such as Christ. By clear implication, then Christ is an angel. The verse for reading the ver the re okay the reason for reading the verse this way has to do with the Greek grammar, and Paul uses the construction but as dot 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 as. He is not contrasting two things, uh, but he is stating that the two things are the same thing. We know this because Paul uses this grammatical construction in a couple of other places in his writings, and the meaning in those cases is unambiguous. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, Paul says, Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as fleshly people, as infants in Christ. The last bit, but as, dot 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 as, indicates two Identifying creatures of the recipients of Paul's letters, they're fleshly people, they're infants in Christ. They are not two contracting, contrasting statements, they modify each other. The same can be said of Paul's comments in 2 Corinthians 2.17, which also has this grammatical feature. But the, this meaning that in Galatians 4.14, Paul is not contrasting Christ with an angel, he is equating him with an angel. Garrett goes... Uh, but this means that in Galatians 4.14, Paul is not contrasting Christ with an angel. He is equating him with an angel. Garrett goes a step further and argues that Galatians 4.14 indicates that Paul identifies Jesus with God's chief angel. If this is the case, then virtually everything Paul says about Christ through his letters makes sense. As the angel of the Lord, Christ is a pre-existent being who is divine. Can, uh, he can be called God and he's God's manifestation on earth in human flesh. Paul says all these things about Christ. I didn't know Pat. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the archangel Michael, the word of John 1 1, and wisdom personified in Proverbs 8 refers to Jesus and his pre human existence, and that he resumed these identities after his ascension to heaven following his death and resurrection. Now let's go back to the ayah. So, this talking about what a prophet would do or not, and the allusion is to Jesus. 
and he would not never ask you to take angels and prophets as lords. Would he ask you to disbelieve after you had been Muslims? After you had submitted? Why is the okay, okay. So uh the other connection with the verse is of course the fact that Jesus never actually said this. The historical Jesus. So I'll give you another reason, uh through which how we know that Jesus never historically or I guess I'll give you one reason why how we know that Jesus didn't historically say these things. Uh, um, the fact that and that there was development in the gospels where the writers later and later tried to make Jesus more and more divine. So uh so first you have to understand that almost consensus that Mark is the earliest gospel. And that almost consensus that uh, there's this uh, uh, thing where Mark was the first gospel, then Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source, and they also used a different source known as Q. The reason we know this is because some of the material is too similar, and a lot of times you have like the exact same thing in Greek. So it's too similar in the Greek. It's obviously they were using them as sources. Q is an unknown source to us. It's probably an other gospel that uh, got lost, right? And Luke tells us there were many gospels. Uh, mo uh, most of those gospels didn't survive. So here's an example of development. Mark 10, 18. Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God himself. Jesus is basically saying, I'm not God. Bro, I'm not God. Matthew, embarrassed by this verse, says, Why do you ask me about what is good? So look, he changed it. Matthew, who's using Mark as a source, as I just showed you. In Mark, he says, Why do you call me good? Matthew changes the question. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Here, Jesus answered, no one is good except God himself. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God himself. Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the command. Okay, so he's changing it. He's changing it. That's development in the Gospels. Okay, again, it shows the Quran is historically right. When uh, it mentions Jesus was just uh, a human being. Okay, now let's go on to some stories that are mentioned in the Quran, also in the Bible, and extra biblical material, just general overview of some of the stories. So there are many stories from the Old Testament and New Testament. For example, Saul as the king story, the story of Yusuf, meaning jo Joseph, the story of Moses, a.k.a. Moses, uh, <laughs> Moses, a.k.a. Musa, a.s. in the Quran. The book of Judges uh, and the drinking of the lake, which is the Saul as king story, even though it's a little bit different in the Bible. Jesus and John's birth, so Isa, uh, a.s. and Yahya, a.s. their birth stories. And uh, Gog and Magog is another story that's also found in uh, the Bible. Okay, so these are the stories from the Bible. You can see an overview: Adam and Eve, uh, sons of Adam. Then uh, Noah story, Abraham, the promised son story, the sacrifice uh, story, the Abraham journeys in Bible and Quran, the uh, the Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah stories, the Joseph stories, the Moses stories, the destruction of uh, Korah. I'm not sure about that, but these are the ones from the Torah. Okay, later Hebrew Bible narratives: Gideon slash Dalut. Okay, so that's another story. Saul, David, and Goliath. Okay, the Queen of Sheba, Jonah, who's Yunus and and the big fish. Haman. Okay, Haman. I'm not sure. No, I don't think Haman is one. But uh, you can see these are narratives that are found in the Bible that are in the Quran. New Testament narratives: Zechariah and Yahya, I mean John the Baptist, quote unquote John the Baptist. Mary. Okay, in the Bible and Quran. Jesus. New Testament narrative, Quran narrative. Okay, so these are the ones from the Bible. Um, and uh, why is this relevant? Because, of course, the Arabs didn't know these stories. So, no, so I just wanted to show you uh, an overall um, overall uh, connection with this stuff. That uh, aside from these uh, intertextual things that we discuss in this series, they're also just the grand over intertextual, which is enough. The fact that the stories are the same. That many of the stories mentioned there are also in the Quran. Why is that relevant? Because that alone is enough to prove it's from God. The fact that the stories are there. In fact, the Jews would uh, challenge the Prophet ﷺ and say, uh, you know, ask him about these stories. If he knows these stories, then he's a true prophet. Okay. They would uh, tell the Arabs when the Arabs at one point sent a delegation. They sent a group of people all the way to to travel all the way to Medina to the Jews and ask him, okay, how do we test this prophet? And they told, uh, asked him, ask. Uh, they said, ask him about Joseph and his brothers. That story, no one knows that story except us Jews. Meaning, no one in Arabia knows that story. Uh, like you, got, basically, they said you, your people, meaning you Meccans, don't know that story. Okay. Uh, and yet, the story is in the Quran. It was revealed. I'll mention 
تلك من أنباء الغيب نوهيها إليك ما كنت تعلمها أنت ولا قومك من قبل هذا فاصبر إن الآقبة للمتقين That is from the news of the unseen which we send down to you being referring to the prophet because it's singular you you knew it not neither you nor your people before this so be patient indeed the best outcome is for the righteous remember in part six i discussed the story of joseph and uh how so the arabs uh, t uh you know they gave a bunch of criteria when the arabs sent a delegation uh so uh, Quraysh, which are the Arabs uh, are, uh, in Mecca, in the city of the Prophet, the polytheists wanted to try to out with the Prophet. They sent a delegation to the Jews of Yathrib, which was the old name of Medina. And they asked the Jews, tell us a question, blah, blah, blah. They asked all these things to the Jews. And so they told them some stories. And one of the things they said was, ask him about the story of Joseph and his brothers. So I think this one, in this one, they ask a, a question and then f about the story of Joseph and his brothers. And they say, uh, this is an interesting point that we will come to again. In Mecca, there were no Christians and Jews. In Mecca, there were only idol worshippers and pagans. There were no centers of Christianity and Judaism. There were, there were one or two private secret converts to Christianity, like Waraqa ibn Nawfal, etc. Uh, and he died, by the way, early on. So, yeah. But he died in like two seconds after the prophet became a prophet. Um, but they were not inviting others to it and not preaching Christianity. Okay, Christianity. There were no libraries of Christian or Jewish theology. Nobody in Mecca knew these stories. The people in Mecca had not heard of Yusuf, meaning Joseph, because he was not their ancestor. Okay. They were descendants from Ismail and not of Ishaq. And the tribes of Israel had nothing to do with the Meccans and the people of Quraysh. They don't know these stories. The, the Jews knew this and they said, ask him if he is truly a prophet to tell you, if he is uh, truly a prophet to tell you what happened with Joseph, a.k.a. Yusuf and his brothers, because nobody knows this of your people. This is something we know, meaning we Jews know this story. You guys don't know it. The Jews lived far away in Yathrib, so how would anybody in Mecca know this? Quraysh went to the prophet, tell us the story of Yusuf and his brothers if you are truly a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that question and revealed Surah Yusuf. Okay. And one of the last verses of the Surah, Allah says, this is of the Ilmul Ghaib, uh, I'll look up that verse. So uh, basically the story uh, where Allah says at the end uh, of the story. That is from the news of the unseen that we send down to you. Okay, so it's here it's Zalika. That is from the news of the unseen which we send down to you. And you are not with them when they put together their plan and they conspire. So the fact that the stories are the same is enough. So I showed you all these biblical stories which are the same. So, story of Adam and Eve, the Noah stories mentioned, the Abraham promised son, sacrifice son, all these things. Also you have from outside the Bible. For example, Second Enoch, which is Apocrypha. Uh, here's an interesting connection. Their angels were appointed over seasons and years. The angels were uh, blah, blah, blah. So basically, and the angels were write all the souls of men and all their deeds and their lives before the Lord's face. Verily over you are appointed angels to protect you in the Quran. Kind and honorable writing down in your deeds. They know and understand all that you do. Okay. So that wasn't a story, but I thought I'd just mention it. The story of Abraham being saved from the fire is in the Talmud, Genesis, Rabbah 38, 11, and in Surah 21. Okay. And also, here's an interesting connection in Surah 21. Verily, ye and the false gods that ye worship besides Allah are fuel for hell. To it will ye surely come. This referring to the first, the word there is uh, ma, which means whatever. So it's a reference to idols, not human beings. Because ma. Is, is like what in Arabic. So uh, those idols are going to be fueled for the hellfire. In the Talmud, it's mentioned. And uh, there is no nation which is smitten that its gods are not smitten together with it. Uh, as it is said, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Judgments, okay. What is smitten? 
I don't know. Strike with a firm or blow. Be strongly attracted to some. <laughs> I am smitten. Okay. Uh, Hair Genesis Rabah. Oh, here's, here, yeah, this is interesting as well. So, in the Quran, Hast thou not turned thy vision to one who disputed with Abraham about his Lord? Because Allah had granted him power. Abraham said, My Lord is he who giveth life and death. He said, I give life and death. Said Abraham, But it is Allah that causeth the sun to rise from east. Do thou then cause him to, ri to cause it to rise from the west. Thus was he confounded, or in arrogance rejected faith, nor, or was flabbergasted, I guess, uh, was, f f uh, the one who disbelieved was flabbergasted, and Allah does not uh, guide the wrongdoing people, or he was, you know, astounded, or whatever, flabbergasted is the word I'm using, uh, dumbfound, I guess. So, uh, this idea of Abraham uh, arguing uh, by, you know, with these with these kinds of arguments, uh, etc., etc., to a king, here it should say, and Abra Abraham said, Abraham, and it is Allah that causes the sun. I don't know why they add but in here. That's just what I wanted to point out. Anyway, this type of arguing Abraham is also in Jewish tradition, Genesis for Bah. Abraham's fa father, Terah, drove Abraham out of his house, blah, 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 and handed him over to Nimrod. Nimrod suggested to Abraham that since he had refused to worship his father's idols because of their want of power, he should worship fire, which is very powerful. Abraham pointed out that water has power over fire, well, said Nimrod, let us declare water God. But, re replied Abraham, the clouds absorb the water, and even they are dispersed by the wind. Then let us declare the wind go our God. Bear in mind, con continued Abraham, that man is stronger than wind and can resist it and stand against it. Nimrod, becoming weary of arguing with Abraham, decided to cast him before his, uh, before his God fire and challenged Abraham's deliverance by the God of Abraham. But God saved him out of the fiery furnace. So I mentioned how the uh, story of... Uh, the fire and Abraham is uh, in the Quran as well, right? So, um, but the point here was the argument. You you check how the argument is very similar to to like uh, how the Quran depicts Abraham arguing. In fact, I'll show you another uh, section in the Quran, which is similar to this. I don't know who Nimrod is, but uh, anyway, when Abraham said to his father Azar. Uh, let's go down. So when the night covered him, he saw a star, this referring to Abraham. He said, this is my Lord. But when it said, he said, I like not those who set. And when he saw the moon rising, he said, this is my Lord. But when it said, he said, when it said, he said, unless my Lord guides me, I will surely be among the people gone astray. And when he saw the sun rising, he said, this is my Lord, this greater. But when it said, he said, oh, my people, indeed, I am free from whatever you associate with him. Indeed, I have turned my face toward he who created the heavens and the earth, or originated the heavens and the earth, inclining toward truth, and I am not of those who associate others with the law. And by the way, this is Abraham wasn't actually thinking these are his gods. Uh, it's clarified. And this was the argument he gave to Abraham to his people. So uh, that's here in this verse. And that was our argument which we gave Abraham against his people. So this was this was just a way of arguing. Uh, he was demonstrating something to them. So you see how it's very similar? So how Genesis Rabbah, uh, the Talmud, uh, mentions Abraham's uh, f stuff. I'll show you the reference for the uh, story. Of Abraham being in fire. Being saved from it. In the Quran as well. Oh, by the way, the story of uh, Abraham destroying the idols. Uh, is in uh, is in the Bible as well. What have you done to our God? So Abraham destroyed them, right? So. What has he done to his... So he made them into fragments, except a large one among them, that they may return to it. And what was this about? I will surely plan against your idols. right? So he destroyed their idols. This is in the Quran as well. And uh, here is the fire one. Burn him and support your gods if you are to act. They, they said this. We said, O fire, be coolness and safety upon Abraham. Okay. That's another word. Okay. So I'll show you that's in the Bible as well. Bible. So there you go. It's in the Bible.
Um, Abraham wrecks terrorist idols. Ooh. So, uh, where is that necessarily? Brought the waters. So, uh, wherever it is, uh, certainly it's in a Jewish uh, tradition somewhere. Oh, okay. Um, I think the Abraham one is in the Bible, but uh, might might have that wrong. Turns out. Let's uh, let's go here. Was it mentioned here? Okay, I guess it's not in the Bible, but uh, anyway, just uh, the the fire one is. Next one, uh, the Gospel of Barth. Tholo, Mew, and the Quran have angels bowing to Adam and Satan refusing. The infancy gospel of James includes some stories in Surah Al Imran about Mary, like angels bringing her food. Like angels bringing her food is in the infancy gospel of James. The infancy gospel of Thomas has the clay birds reference that Jesus made clay birds into real birds. The Isaac of Antioch homily on Cain and, and Abel mentions the Cain and Abel story in Surah Tul Maida, including the phrase. So uh, the story of uh, Cain and Abel, like uh, the, the one brother killing the other, is here. So here, you, Cain, be the judge and judge justice between me and you. Do not unjustly stretch out your hand against the blood of the upright one. Uh, okay. In the Quran, if you... Thou dost stretch thy hand against me to slay me. It is not for me to stretch my hand against thee to slay thee, for I do fear Allah, the cherisher of all the worlds. So even the exact phrase is quoted correctly, that uh, stretch your hand uh, against the blood of the upright one, if thou stretch thy hand against me, for me to stretch my hand. Okay, right, so clearly the, the Quran knows even the exact words. The seven sleepers story, again, mentioned in the Quran and also in Jacob of Sarah and also in others, Herod the Romanist Bella de Joseph, I mentioned this before as well. The brother said to Joseph, Father, why do you groan? Behold, the joy we have found in the bags because of the grain stopped willing. Then when they opened their bag package, they had found their stock and trade had been returned to them. They said, Oh, our father, what more can we desire? This is our stock and trade has been returned to us. This is in the Quran. It's not actually a story in the Bible. I mentioned the one about the women cutting their hands. That's, that's in uh, Jewish tradition as well. Also this one, Hamilton and Joseph. He said to them, and if I do find out what will happen, and they said, we will all be slaves to your Lord. This the same incident in the Quran. They said, the penalty should be that he in whose saddlebag it is found should be held as a bondman to atone for the crime. Thus it is we punish the wrongdoers, meaning they become a slave, okay? Babylonian Talmud. Okay, so uh, when the Holy One, blessed be he, wished to create man, he first created a company of ministering angels and said to them, it is your desire that we make man in our image. Even the man in our image thing is in a hadith. They answered, Sovereign of the universe, what will be his deeds? Such and such will be his deeds, he replied. Thereupon they exclaimed, Sovereign of the universe, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou thinkest of him? Okay. Thereupon, thereupon he stretched out his little finger among them and consumed them with fire. The same thing happened with the second company. The third company said to him, Sovereign of the universe, what did it avail the former angels that they spoke to thee as they did? The whole world is thine, and whatever that thou wishest to do therein, do it. In the Quran, this is actually corrected. Angels are corrected in the Quran. But certainly this whole idea is not there. Anyway, as that lows, we also discussed Job's story with Satan being blamed, that parallel. So... I mentioned this before too. Also this one. So I mentioned this before how there's a story in the Talmud about how, how Job blames Satan. That's in the Quran too. Babylonian Talmud. And they stood, basically it's the same story but uh, as the one in the Bible, but the connection of uh, blaming Satan. Here's this one, Babylonian Talmud. And they stood under the mount. This is the Holy One, blessed be he, overturned the mountain upon them like an inverted cask. So basically that the mountain was on top of the the Jews before the covenant was taken. That's in the Talmud in the Quran as well. Does not in the uh, Bible. 
remember we took your covenant and we raised above you, or it is hinted to in the Bible, but not explicitly. And remember we took your covenant and we raised above you saying, uh, hold firmly, uh, raise above you the mount saying, uh, hold firmly what we have given you and bring ever to remembrance that is therein. Perhaps ye may fear Allah. <laughs> Perhaps you may fear Allah. That's a weird, weird translation. Okay. I mentioned these before. Okay, so I don't think necessarily all of these are relevant or, or even connections, but uh, yeah. The one I said before is the one I will stick with. Here's the angel one version of the angel one in the Quran. Correcting it, I would say. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَائِلٌ فِي الْأَرُضِ خَلِيفَةٌ قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مِنَ اللَّهِ sorry قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ and when your Lord said to the angels, Indeed, I will make upon the earth a successive authority, they said, Will you place upon it one who causes corruption therein and sheds blood, while we exhale to you with praise and declare your perfection? He said, Indeed, I know that which you do not know. And we taught Adam the names, all of them. Then he showed them to the angels and said, Inform me of the names of these if you are truthful. He said, Exalted are you, we have no knowledge except what you have taught us. Indeed, it is you who is the knowing the wise. Okay. Okay. He said, O oh Adam, inform me of their names. And when he had informed them of their names, he said, Did I not tell you that I know the unseen of the heavens and the earth? And I know that what you reveal, and I know what you reveal and what you concealed. Okay, so uh, uh, even the prostrate before Adam's story is uh, elsewhere in uh, Jewish Christian tradition. And this one as well, that uh, the uh, Adam knowing the names. And remember, this one was connected to this one. Where you know the angels and this and that. What are his de? He created a company of ministering angels. What will? And then he told, "It is your desire that we make man in our image, sovereign of the universe. What will be his de? So he destroys him. Blah 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 blah. Okay, so it's just correcting it. And uh, the other one I mentioned. What did I mention? Right. So this one as well. Uh, Adam prostrating is uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Adam prostrate story dead sea scrolls. I always thought that the Abraham destroying the idols thing was uh, in here. So I think it's the life of Adam and Eve. Life of Prostrate. Ooh, Michael, uh, bow down. Okay, whatever. Uh, I I guess I'll just put that in the next video if I find it. Anyway, let's just do. I would say uh, another small one because. Uh, this video is long already, so I'll do a small one and then I'll wrap it up. God, so much stuff. Okay. okay, let's just scroll down to the next part. These are essentially like streams at this point. Oh God, this is long as well. Um, da, 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 da. Wait, let me see if I can just scroll very much down. Okay, so let's do this one. David's date. When was David born? So, uh, 
according to uh, Jewish tradition, the universe is just, or uh, I guess the first humans were just like almost 6,000 years old. 5,761. Okay. The story of David uh, happened in uh, 907 BC. So that's uh, 3,000 years ago. So that's uh, in the first half of when humans were created, according to them. Interestingly, this is historically wrong. We have these tablets, which are dated to around 5,000 BC, which is 7,000 years ago. Okay. Here, these tablets from the, uh, so uh, 5,000 BC, around 5,000 BC, so early 4th BC. Okay, anyway, in uh, the Quran, in the Hadith, it's mentioned that actually this is wrong because it mentions about David. Uh, he saw one of them, so uh, God presented Adam's offspring to him, and so Adam sees one. He saw one of them whose ray between his eyes amazed him, so he said, O Lord, who is this? He said, This is a man from the later nations of your offspring called Dawood, from the later nations, not the first half of the world, no, later nations, okay? So the Quran makes it, or the Hadith make it clear that uh, it is late. Uh, okay, I'll mention this one too. So, uh, you know, in uh, the Gospels, Jesus is like a voodoo mystery guy. Like, he doesn't tell anyone who he is. There's a big theme of Mark and John and this one. No one can figure out who he is. Uh, you can look this up online. Check out what people, uh, scholars all mention this. That, uh, for example, if you read Mark, no one can figure out who he is. Is he, you know, who is he? What's what's up? In fact, uh, Jesus is very elusive. He says stuff like when they say, uh, you're claiming to be the Messiah, etc., etc., uh, he's very elusive. He's like, you say that I, when they say, uh, when they claim that he's claiming to be the son of God or whatever, he says, you say that. Or when people ask him, who are you? He says, uh, who do you say I am? And then he says to a couple of his disciples that figured out he's the Messiah, he says, don't tell, don't tell, uh, don't tell, don't tell people I'm the Messiah and whatnot. Quran fixes all this. He's very straightforward in the Quran. He, as a baby, this is speaking. This is Jesus speaking as a baby. I'm the slave of Allah. He has destined me to He has destined me to be given the scripture and to be a prophet. He has get, so literally it reads, I, I've been given the book and been made a prophet. Uh, and he has made me he has given me the book and made me a prophet. And when Jesus, son of Maryam, said, O children of Israel, I am truly Allah's messenger to you, confirming the Torah which came before me and giving good news of a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmed, who is our messenger, first Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Yet when he came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is pure magic. I'll show, I'll show you some subtle in, interaction with uh, Christian beliefs, maybe. Mm, uh, depending how long this is. Now, I'll just show you this one. To end it, so uh, Adam's day. When was Adam created? So the day of Adam's creation. The apostle law said, "The best day on which the sun has risen is Friday. On it, Adam was created. On it, he was expelled. On it, his con uh, contrition was accepted, meaning his repentance. I think. On it, he died. On it, on on it, the last hour will take place. On Friday, every beast is on the lookout from dawn to sunrise in fear of the last hour, but not jinn and men. And it contains a time at which no Muslim prays and asks anything from Allah, but He will give it to him." Kaab said, that is one day every year. So I said, it is on every Friday. Kaab read the Torah and said, the Apostle of Allah has spoken the truth. Torah, of course, they had a different Torah. They had the real Torah. Uh, and I've discussed this before. Abu Huraira said, I met Abdullah ibn Salam and told him of my meeting with Kaab. Abdullah ibn Salam said, I know what time it is. Abu Huraira said, I asked him to tell me about it. Abdullah ibn Salam said, it is at the very end of Friday. I asked, how can it be when the Apostle of Allah said, no Muslim finds it while he is praying. And this is the moment moment when no prayer is offered. Abdullah ibn uh, Salam said, has the possible of Allah said, if anyone is seated waiting for the prayer, he is engaged in the prayer until he observes. Okay. Notice how in this hadith, Gab read the Torah and, uh, Torah and affirms that what the Prophet said was true, that Adam was created on Friday. If we read the creation account in the Old Testament book of Genesis, we will see that Adam was created on the sixth day, being Friday. Uh, hey, on Friday, every beast is, uh, la, 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 la. 
So the apostle of Allah has spoken the truth, right? So all this from was from the apostle of Allah. This is the Old Testament, and God said, uh, "And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the earth." Blah blah blah. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created them. And God saw everything He had made was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day so God created Adam on the sixth day so how did this minute detail get uh, the Quran got it correct as well so uh, let's sum it up again we're looking at intertextuality between the Quran and Judeo-Christian tradition biblical and extra biblical how the Quran has intimate knowledge of these Hebrew Greek Syriac texts many of which were untranslated and in different areas Yet the Qur'an will reference or respond to them. The author of the Qur'an clearly knew these texts and languages, yet Muhammad wasallam couldn't read or write, nor could the Arabs as a whole. In fact, the Arabs were unfamiliar with even the basic biblical stories. This proves Islam, especially especially when you put it together with the other things we know about Islam in Qur'an and Muhammad wasallam, like the Qur'an's literary miracle, prophecies of Muhammad wasallam, historical miracles of the Qur'an, the biblical prophecies of Muhammad wasallam, the message of Islam and being far superior to every other religion, the miraculous, the miraculous expansion of Islam, etc., etc.